This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good morning. Thanks, everybody, for coming this morning. Um, I hope you'll stick with us throughout the day. Welcome back to Dirty Sexy Policy. I'm Jennifer Holt, um, along with Constance Penley and Karen Petruska. We are really thrilled to have you guys all here. Um, I'm going to introduce now our keynote speaker, Des Friedman. Um, we've imported our keynote for the day all the way from London, not just because he's an amazing and enthusiastic dancer, which I've witnessed firsthand, but really because he's one of the keenest minds thinking about policy today, particularly in a global framework. Um, Des is extremely prolific, he's expansive, he's an inspirational thinker and a truly passionate writer. Um, his work on media and power through the lenses of policy making and regulation is really exemplary. He's produced dozens of academic articles, in, including some of the most articulate and uh, widely circulated on the political and policy stakes of the News Corp phone hacking scandal. Um, a wide range of journalistic work on politics and policy, as well as books on television and the policies of the Labor Party, war and media, media and terrorism, and two that are very well read in the Film and Media Studies Department here, The Politics of Media Policy and Misunderstanding the Internet, which he co-wrote with James Curran and Natalie Fenton. He also co-edited a manifesto for resistance called The Assault on Universities, which enlists us all to think more broadly about the role of public education globally and has been quite important for thinking through many of our own concerns here at the UC. He's an editor of the journal Global Media Communication, Global, sorry, Global Media and Communication, and a board member of the new Online Media Industries Journal. He also serves on the National Council of the Campaign for Press and Broadcasting Freedom, and he's a founding member and current chair of the Media Reform Coalition, in the UK that was set up following the revelation of the 2011 phone hacking at News Corporation. So he does more than just teach and write about media activism, he lives it in many ways and models for scholars and students how we can integrate activist politics more organically into the work and the role of education. He's currently writing a book called, oh no, he's current, he just finished a book called The Contradictions of Media Power, which we can all look for later this year. Um, Des's work has been fundamental to how students of media and communication understand the process and impact of media policy making. He shows us time and time again, um, whether he intends to or not, just how truly dirty and sexy policy is. He writes and speaks out about making powerful voices accountable he lays bare the processes of policy making and rallies the rest of us to demand that democratic institutions behave as such in order to get the types of media that we all want and deserve. His work explains the sometimes impenetrable universe of internet governance, market definitions, media ownership, and the foundations of media policy in ways that let everybody into the conversation without diluting the power or the complexity of the issues. And that is a, that's a tricky um, line to, to follow, um, keeping these ideas, keeping the sophistication and allowing um, for kind of a more broad audience in. And, and he really is a model for how to do that. He's written some of the most incisive analyses of topics ranging from internet freedom and the privatization of infrastructure, um, which is a big topic for us here today, to media reform, media diversity, and the role of journalism 
and the importance of public service for the policy realm. His latest work takes this approach to interrogating how power is maintained in the most public arenas of our culture to focus on university policies and the future of higher education. I'm gonna be really interested to read and see which group Des thinks presents us with a tougher challenge, university administrators or media regulators. I'll be eager to see. He says administrators. <laughs> um, we're thrilled to have him here to kick off our day of um, round tables, which begin at 11.15 and continue at 2.30, and the last one will be at 4.15. Um, Des will be giving us some insight on what he's calling, much to the organizer's delight, uh, media policy fetishism. And we're really, really lucky to have him join us here today and get our day of conversations going. So please join me in giving Professor Des Friedman a warm welcome to Santa Barbara. Thank you very much, Jen. That's definitely the most generous introduction I've ever had. I wish my kids would ever think those kinds of things, let alone say them. Um, and I'm I really am thrilled to, to be here. I didn't necessarily think it was going to take place in that rather seedy nightclub in Istanbul, but great things come from, from seedy situations. So um, it's, it is a, a, an area that I guess I have been trying to make sense of for, um, for some years and following the work of many of the people um, in this room. But it allows me to talk about media policy in the way that I'm, I'm most comfortable with. That media policy for me is not something that is dull, or at least it ought not to be an issue that's dull, but also something that is um, not hygienic or anaesthetized, but actually as something, and I thought long about which word I should use, but the media policy is something soiled. Now, before you get excited, all I mean by that is that it, we should understand it in relation to the soil from which it emerges, and that's what I want to do um, in, in my talk. So I want to talk uh, initially about sex, then about dirt, and I guess if there's time, I'll talk about policy um, towards, towards the end. Now, well, let me say something, just to, to, to put it into context, that we do normally think about policy, uh, about media and communications policy, as something that is rather dry and technical, and that it takes place in a very limited number of fora, so that we normally think of it taking place in state rooms, in committee chambers, in parliaments, in palaces, in offices, in official spaces. We don't often think that media policy takes place in the bedroom. Maybe we need to start changing our very narrow approach, if that's the case, because it's kind of out of step with a, with a particularly modern breakdown of the distinction between the private and the public. Um, so I'm going to talk for a little bit, and I apologize in advance. Always best to speak of what you know. So I'll talk about the UK, and you will all uh, gloriously fill in with what's going on um, closer to home. But it looks to me that when we're thinking about the UK, we seem to have been a little bit affected by a very European taste for romance at the highest levels um, of the media. So let me give you one such example. This is, this is pretty typical. Um, this is a letter written by uh, Rebecca Brooks, who was the former editor of the, the best-selling newspaper in the country, in Britain, The Sun. She was the former chief executive of the News Corp UK subsidiary. A letter from her, she's at the top of her game in, in British media, very influential, to a man called Andy Coulson, who was a, a former editor of the News of the World, again, the, the best-selling Sunday, um, and a top advisor to the Prime Minister, David Cameron. Um, and in this letter, it's a very moving letter, and she says, the fact is that you are my best, these are her words, I'm not paraphrasing, I promise you. The fact is that you are my very best friend. Um, uh, I tell you everything, I confide in you, I seek your advice, I love you, care about you, worry about you. We laugh and cry together. In fact, without our relationship in my life, I'm really not sure how I will cope. Now this kind of, uh, uh, you know, as lovers, this suggests to me it's the perfect union of political and media power that cannot but impact on media policy itself. Two people at the top of their game in those particular spheres. Actually, the, 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 the very same Rebecca Brooks has been in regular contact uh, recently, although I, I should make this clear, not in the bedroom in this particular case, um, with the Prime Minister, David Cameron, who is a neighbour of hers in the very beautiful 
Oxfordshire village of Chipping Norton, um, and, they, and they text each other. I'm not sure if it now, if it's, they still do. It's a bit awkward now. Uh, she's currently on trial in ways I'll explain. But anyway, they, they spent many years texting each other, including when he was Prime Minister, and he used to regularly, this is a very famous anecdote in the UK, he used to regularly sign off his texts to her. This is the British Prime Minister to the formerly the head of the News Corps um, division in the UK. He used to sign off LOL, which, according to Brooks herself, Cameron thought meant lots of love, which tells you a lot about in whose hands British digital policy is. Anyway, she did, she did correct him, and it, this didn't appear to sour their relationship in any way. Um, one example is that following one of his uh, many speeches at the Conservative Party conference as Prime Minister, she immediately texted him. Again, just think this through. She was the head of News UK, the, the, the British division of News Corps. She texted him, quote, brilliant speech. I cried twice. We'll love working together in inverted commas, working together. Again, this is such a fantastic exposition of the intimacy involved in, in media policy. Now, following her recent difficulties, she is, as I say, a as we speak, um, on trial for a range of charges, including conspiring to pay money to public officials and concealing evidence in relation to allegations of, um, of phone hacking. But anyway, uh, during the trial, he texted her um, uh, to, what are the words, keep your head up, and exposed regret that he couldn't support her more in, in public. Now, you may dismiss all of this as tittle-tattle and gossip worthy of the tabloid newspapers that I seem to be dismissing so easily. But what's interesting for me is that it's not come out in gossipy circles. It hasn't come out in the pages of the News of the World. These particular statements and letters um, have come out in the court cases and the public inquiries that have emerged since phone hacking. They've come out in very formal um, uh, arenas. And that they have revealed to many millions of people, these inquiries and, uh, uh, and court cases, um, the complicity between press and politicians. They have raised for many millions of people in Britain the issue of proprietorial power over both political and policy cultures in the UK. We now have, it's the best teaching tool ever, we have fantastic evidence of the systematic skewing of news and policy agendas, including the government's view on the efficacy of specific media mergers, let alone its wider orientation over media policy. Um, uh, and that this has taken place following concerted pressure by media owners, uh, together with the more everyday encounters, um, whether in the bedroom, the living room, or the office, between senior politicians on the one hand and editors and proprietors on the other. Now, I have long argued that media policy is not the clean, administrative, depoliticized, and interest-free space in which it is sometimes held up to be almost certainly by no one in this room, but that is a sort of taken for granted assumption shared by many people. Um, as far as I see it, I think you have to look uh, at, at elsewhere and have a different view of media policy. If you want to get to grips, and I guess this follows on from what Nick was saying last night, but if you want to get to grips with, um, with media policy, uh, you need to look at, um, at golf courses, you need to look in country clubs, you need to look in relatively, no, not, it, not relatively, very fancy restaurants, you need to be at the back entrances to Downing Street in the UK, where Murdoch had a special key, almost, never went in the front, could go in, um, in, in the back. Um, you need to go to where the high-level seminars, which is where the agenda is often set and where solution to current problems to the extent, I put problems in inverted commas, because uh, this is to the extent that some issues are seen as problems, whereas others, which we, we may consider important, are not seen as problems. But anyway, you have to look to these other spaces, much more private and elite spaces, to, to, to look at the structuring um, of, of the agenda. But on the other hand, if you want a more comprehensive view of policy, you need to look at it in a much more expansive way um, as well. And to look at policy as Bill, Bill Kirkpatrick, who's in the audience today, as he describes it in a great article recently, he describes it as a vernacular practice. Um, it's embedded, it's an everyday practice that is embedded in people's lives and that interacts with 
daily practices of media consumption and production, which is why it's so frustrating for those of us who try and teach or just um, eulogize about media policy that not everyone else finds it as interesting as we do because it affects so many of the things that we do in our daily lives. Bill gives a great example, um, going back to, I guess, 2008, of how consumers used the $40 coupons that were given out by the government to offset the cost of digital set-top boxes during the transition to, to, to digital television, they, they use these coupons in very creative and slightly unexpected ways, basically to go into, what, Best Buy, um, to, to um, buy the, the set-top boxes, um, get a couple of them, and then return them the next day and swap them for something that they actually did want. Now, that is media policy. That's grassroots media policy in action. Um, and you need to get, a, uh, you know, look at both sets of spaces and look at it as a very diverse form of practice. So, for me, policy is necessarily messy. It's, not nece it's necessarily dirty. Not necessarily characterized by dirty money in the sense of um, outright corruption, or in terms of what I see as the structurally unequal practices that are involved in lobbying uh, in places like the UK and the US. So not necessarily dirty in that way, sometimes perhaps, but simply because it can't be clean and free of the ideological preferences, of the partisan self-interest, of the corporate priorities and personal compatibilities that must necessarily characterize media policy practices. So call me conspiratorial if, if you want, but I believe, personally, that it is significant that Tony Blair, you remember Tony Blair, important character. Tony Blair was the Prime Minister of Britain for 10 years, a very good friend of George Bush during the, uh, the war in Iraq. That Tony Blair is godparent to Grace, who is Mur Rupert Murdoch's second youngest child. Now, are you aware of that? I mean, it's none of your business. Why should you be aware of it? <laughs> but, but this is the case. Um, he's, yeah, he's, he's um, the godparent to, um, to, to Grace. And it may be that this very intimate relationship developed over many years um, before Tony Blair actually became Prime Minister, um, that this level of intimacy may be related to the fact that no action was ever taken by the Labour government um, to tackle Murdoch's media interests in the UK. Now, I am not sure, genuinely, how this relationship has been affected by the recent revelations of romantic encounters between Tony on the one hand and Rupert's ex-wife, Wendy, which shamefully for you took place just up the road in Carmel. But Vanity Fair insisted, quote, that Murdoch had virtually put Blair into office. That's what that, his phrase. So this is a, a beautiful relationship worthy of Casablanca between these two um, um, that has huge implications for media policy. And what's so incredible is the story is not going away. Only two days ago, um, it emerged that Tony Blair had often offered his personal, though off-the-record, um, support to Rebecca, Rebecca Brooks and Murdoch in the light of the phone hacking scandal just before Rebecca Brooks, for example, was, uh, was arrested. This was a, an email that was leaked out, was read out in the trial of Rebecca Brooks, um, where, he, where he offers directly his support as a very powerful player. So it's a kind of, it's the most fantastic menage a trois, but without any sex. So I know I'm on camera, I'm not suggesting anything um, like that would have been happening, but the relationships are there for all to see. Now, all of this is, is great fun, but I'm not sure that sex and dirt, as important genuinely as they are, and as much fun as they are to talk about, ne necessarily provide us with quite enough material with which to make sense of what's going on in um, contemporary communications policies. That maybe, as well as thinking through these different ways, um, uh, of, of breaking out of the anaesthetized and hygienic approach to media policy. We need to do that, but we also need to find a conceptual framework that better expresses some of the dynamics that we, we do find at the heart of the process. Now, I've str struggled to do this, um, and I've written previously about, I, I, I tried to um, address this by, by talking of what I call media policy silences. The silences, for me, these are the gaps in the policy process. These are the unasked questions. These are the untabled agendas. These are the uninvited players, the unspoken assumptions that account for the non-decision-making power at the heart of media policy making. So why is it that, for example, uh, we have Victor Picard in the room? Why is it that despite Victor's amazing efforts, 
that any mention of public subsidies for public-oriented news is seen as beyond the pale and is, and is seen as undiscussable, if that is such a word. Why is it that levies, which have a great historical um, uh, role, uh, particularly across uh, um, Europe, that levies on, on some of the largest intermediaries and aggregators to fund content from which they then benefit, are also seen as constraining innovation. We keep putting forward these policies. Google, you may remember, offered under some pressure by the French government, $50 million to fund some public service journalism. So we've been discussing with the Labour government, why don't you um, in, put some pressure to do the same, to try and offset the loss of the local journalism jobs. You know, there's huge unemployment, unemployment and a crisis in local journalism. Then you have Google with lots of money that they could be persuaded to part with, which would be good both for the new journalist and for Google to have more content. Um, but it is undiscussable. It's not something that is allowed to be put on the agenda. Why, as I also keep asking the UK, why is it always the case that the size of B Sky B, which is Rupert Murdoch's organization, which is the largest broadcaster in Britain, why is the size of B Sky B never seen as an issue, but the size of the publicly funded BBC is always seen as an issue? B Sky B is pretty much double the size of the BBC, but all you hear about is the, uh, the hegemony, the unhealthy domination of the news environment by the BBC. The size of B Sky B is not a problem. And I think we can, we can use this to think of some of the problems we're de dealing with um, later today. We should be asking who has the power to define obscenity in such a way as to legitimize some policy agendas, but clearly to marginalize others. Why do we conceive of net neutrality as a, quote, traffic management issue, and not, as I see it, as a fundamental question of equality, access, democracy? Um, so I think that it's a useful approach to think about the unspoken, unsaid, about the silences. But actually, I, I don't think it's enough to make sense um, of what is going on, which is very much in front of us, not just the silences, but the presences. Um, so I've been trying, and, and inspired by Jen and the idea of dirty, sexy policy, um, I thought that there may be uh, another way to make sense of what is in front of us. For example, the continuing uproar over net neutrality. But some of the other things that I'm involved in uh, on a daily basis um, back home, battles over press freedom. I don't know why I have to put that in inverted commas, but you do now, because we don't own. Who owns the phrase? Um, but also for, um, the pursuit of media pluralism, as it's described in Europe for you, media diversity, to name just a few things. So it's at this stage that I will turn to fetishism. Now, you are, as an intelligent audience, immediately going to say that of all the elements in the media world that are least applicable to the practice of fetishism, which I understand as the, the worship of things that are made by humans, but then endowed with godlike status, if that's the definition of, um, of, a, of, of a fetish, then surely media policy, sadly for us, is not at the top of the list. What might be the top of the list is, uh, I don't know, the iPad mini with retina display, 64 gig? <laughs> Understandably so. Um, Mad Men, speaking personally, that might be near the top of the list, although it should say, a huge public policy issue for me is that Mad Men used to be shown on the BBC and thus free to air for the first two series and is now on Sky, which is the, the, the pay TV channel. So I, as a useless point of principle, don't subscribe to that. So I have no idea what's happened in Mad Men in the last five years. I don't understand why this isn't a huge public policy outlaw in this in Britain. But anyway, but I could see why that might be uh, uh, encourage fetishistic behavior. Anyone who's seen, I don't know, what are the Oscar favorites this year of 12 Years a Slave? You might, those kinds of things we can agree might encourage um, fetishistic behavior. The internal machinations of the FCC, ongoing debates concerning the regulation. Actually, I think more and more it's not the regulation, it's the irregulation we should be concentrating on, of things like infrastructure and privacy. They are not generally processes that inspire adulation or absorb the attention of millions and millions of people. Apart from all of us in this room, we don't actually worship at the altar of media policy on a daily basis. Secondly, thinking through another dimension of fetishism, following the more bodily practices of, of, of the term, 
i.e. In, in terms of attempts to reroute sexual activity um, to other parts of the body. I don't see media policy as a displacement for other activities. Despite the wonderful conference poster, I'm not sure I see media policy as the stiletto that distracts us from the central pleasure point of our media world, whatever that may be, and I fully intend to take the conference poster home with me. No, I don't see it. So I'm employing this term, which actually in its most common usages doesn't have anything to tell us about um, media policy. So that is a problem for me. But actually, I turn to, to fetishism um, uh, at another level, and I think that fetishism works at a, at a much deeper level, shaping and distorting our relationships to products and processes with which we are, we as ordinary citizens, I should say, with which we are involved at all levels. And here I'm, you're probably not surprised, um, I'm going to draw on ideas about commodity fetishism developed 150 years ago by Marx and refined by others including Lukács and more recently the anthropologist Michael Taussig. Now, Ma Marx originally developed his ideas of fetishism to describe the magical hold um, exerted by very ordinary objects created by humans through their labour when these objects are circulated in a market and where the objective is profit. And as I keep telling my students, I, it's one of my favourite lectures, as I keep telling my students, for example, under capitalism, a table is not just a table. I look at that and I almost salivate, I'm afraid to say, but it's, it's a piece of wood. Anyway, this is what Marx writes about it. He says, the form of wood, for instance, is altered by making a table out of it. Yet for all that, the table continues to be that common, very day thing, wood. But so soon as it steps forth as a commodity, it is changed into something transcendent. It not only stands with its feet on the ground, but in relation to all other commodities, it stands on its head and evolves out of its wooden brain grotesque ideas far more wonderful than table turning ever was. So what he's saying is that the wonder of the world in which we live, this for him the new emerging form of capitalism, is that it is somehow able to persuade us that the value of this gorgeous table lies not with the labour that produced it, but it somehow lies inside the table itself. The table appears to us to have an objective character independent of, separated from the social relations, and in particular that is the relations between people, um, that created it. So what he's alluding to in his analysis of this strange and mysterious world of um, commodities that exert such a fascination on us is about our loss of control, our alienation from the productive process, from our power. Now the crucial point, that's half the story, the crucial point is not simply that we give life to these objects, that we overvalue these external objects and processes, but in the act of doing so, we undervalue ourselves. We sell ourselves short by endowing these kinds of objects with so much power. So what we do is we animate external objects or processes and in, in the act of doing so, diminish our own power. So this is a great uh, and I think very clear quote from the anthropologist Michael Taussig on, uh, on fetishism, where he argues that it, that it denotes the attribution of life, autonomy, power, and even dominance to otherwise inanimate objects, like that lovely table I wish I owned, and presupposes the draining of these qualities from the human actors who bestow the attribution. I am going to talk about media policy in a minute, I'm sure. So commodity fetishism, it, it involves the projection of mystery, beauty and awe to objects that we have produced, while at the same time it conceals the fact that it was us, that it was our labour that produced these objects. So very quickly, I just want to think about four characteristics of this, and then I'll think about how this might play out in terms um, of a fetishised media policy. Is that all right? Am I doing anything that you wanted me to do? Good. Right. Um, so four ve very quick features, I guess, of, um, uh, of fetishism. The first is that it naturalises, that fetishism naturalises um, the whole process of commodification. Why would we go along with something that diminishes our power? You have to come up with an explanation for it, and it's something to do with the character of, of, um, of fetishism itself. What happens, according to Taussig, is that, in his words, an ether of naturalness conceals and enshrouds human social organisation. The beauty of the market 
is that it makes the valuing of objects above ordinary social relations seem so normal, so unquestionable, seem so common sense. How could we do things otherwise is what we, we, we don't even ask the question. It just seems that's the only way of doing things. How could you think that that table is not going to make me happy? How could we not think that our MacBooks are not going to make us more powerful individuals? We, we, we buy it. We buy into it. So something about fetishism naturalizes the, the, the process itself. Secondly, that when we focus on external objects at the expense of privileging our own agency, we run the risk of decontextualizing the world in which we live, of atomizing social relations, so that the meaning lies in the object or the thing itself, as opposed to the networks of relationships and the historical and the whole range of contexts um, uh, uh, in, in which this production takes place. So we run the risk of decontextualizing uh, social relations. Thirdly, we have the consequence of feti that fetishism is involved in the objectification of social life. If you want to put it more crudely, um, as I call it, the thingification of everyday life. It turns complex social processes into things, into tangible objects. The, um, the Hungarian Marxist George Lukács puts it a little more e elegantly when he developed a theory um, of what he called reification of the act of characterizing relations between people as thing-like. Um, and he argued that under conditions of market exchange, social relationships, and I please do remember this, this phrase, he argued that social relationships under capitalism require a, quote, phantom objectivity, an autonomy that seems so strictly rational and all-embracing as to conceal every trace of its fundamental nature, which for him was the relation between people, the phantom objectivity that may come back and haunt us. And the final feature I wanted to touch on is that through fetishism, um, the real dynamics of the social word are, are, are mystified and made spectral. So uh, the British cultural theorist Mike Wayne describes it like this. He, he argues that commodity fetishism represses, rubs away and dematerializes the social relations of an activity or commodity and just leaves us with its physical materiality, isolated with uh, isolated or with its interdependence with everything else fading away. So for me, social processes start to have a, a kind of ghost-like appearance. We think we see them for what they are, but they seem to have this life independent of their very creators. Now, what on earth does all of this have to do with you people in the room and with media policy? And I have, what, 20 minutes or so to, um, to try and convince you that it may be useful. My answer is because I think fetishism applies is relevant not simply to commodities as objects, but also to social interactions and political processes in which the interplay between individuals is displaced and instead in which these processes are seen as autonomous, independent and rational. For me, it speaks to what many people perceive of our, as our loss of control over policy making, that it appears to be a process utterly separate to us, external to us, reified, although, as I apologize again, perhaps lacking the transcendence that uh, Marx ascribes to other sorts of commodities like the eye touch. Um, but anyway, a couple of examples. The, the average British person, I'm, the, the numbers are fairly similar in the US as well, the average British person spends at least eight hours a day on communicative activity. In fact, a study by one of the mobile cell phone companies last year found that as adults we spend far more time with our cell phones than we do alone with our partners. Okay, so we have intimate relationships with these objects, and yet, even though our lives are taken up with mediated interaction, we have very little connection to or involvement in the debates that structure these communicative environments that we spend so much time with. And even for me, as someone who really is you know, intimately involved in media policy debates, both as a theorist, as an activist, um, whether, it's giving, whether it's dressing up like this and giving evidence to the House of Lords, or wearing jeans and organizing rallies, in, it, it, to a certain extent, there is a kind of phantom objectivity attached to the media policy process. I mean, I know I'm involved in it. Sometimes people even ask me to be involved in it. Um, but it's hard to touch. It always seems out of reach. It always seems shaped by other forces. When I say shadowy forces, I don't mean in a conspiratorial way there. I just mean I'm not quite sure who, but I know, it's, I know it's not me. So where, who gets to shape 
this, uh, this agenda. It's always slightly out of reach, never quite present, but presented to us as eminently sensible, scientific, rational. Now, there are some obvious reasons for this. In part, it's because I think in a wholly commercial environment, media policy is always a little apologetic. This isn't just to do with the First Amendment and speech rights, um, because we, we shouldn't really need an activist or an, a, a purposeful and interventionist media policy. We shouldn't really need it because broadband networks should build themselves. Traffic should manage itself. Parents should switch off the TV when there is material that they may think um, will upset their kids, or we should turn on the filter. So we shouldn't actually need a media policy it, the market should take care of it all. So there's a certain element that media policy is always trying to remove traces of itself, which I think is exactly what, what government attempts to do under conditions of neoliberalism, which is to use its power to rub itself out, to make itself invisible. This is the non-regulation that Nick was talking about last night. And until you get explosions, unexpected explosions, such as the 2003 movement against the deregulation of ownership, or more recently, um, uh, the, uh, the, the opposition to the attempt to roll back net neutrality rules, or I guess most obviously in relation um, to the exposure of the scale of government surveillance of all of our data. But un without those explosions, much of this activity does indeed remain out of bounds. So what I want to do is to try and think through um, some uh, dimensions of, of, of this ghostly policy process. The first one, I, I, I think, in terms of a fetishistic media policy environment, is uh, concerns the evacuation of the meaning of key policy concepts. Now, we have Phil Napoli in this room, who's done more than anyone. We are indebted to him for systematically evaluating the history and the meaning of core policy concepts. So I hope everyone in this room has, has read his work and is able to flawlessly um, uh, deploy these concepts in the way in which they ought to be deployed. But the problem is that most often this is not, the, the concepts themselves are not deployed in those eminently rational ways. And actually they are way, used in ways that distort their meanings and distort the whole process. Just take, as an obvious example, the, uh, the phrase of the public interest, which is all too often seen and, and uh, uh, um, um, deployed in very simplistic ways basically in terms of the satisfaction of the public's appetite as opposed to any notion of the common good. Um, as was most powerfully articulated, the very famous definition in the early 80s by the then FCC chairman Mark Fowler, that the public's interest defines the public interest. Now that for me just is it's the same as saying that public health is defined by what we eat, which judging by levels of, of obesity in Britain, which is something like 60%, and I imagine it's pretty high in the US as well, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't augur well um, if, if that's your definition. Um, but we see the evacuation of meaning in relation to a whole number of other terms that I'm sure you will be able to go through later, localism, uh, universalism, all, all sorts of things. There are two particular terms that I've been working with um, in, in recent times uh, uh, over in the UK. The first is around pluralism, which is the, the European term for diversity. Um, which is supposed to be a foundational principle that does two things, and we can kind of agree on what those things are. First, that pluralist, a pluralistic environment, a diverse media environment, um, should provide citizens with a full range of information. And secondly, that it should also break up undue concentrations of power. This is actually accepted by the official policymakers in Britain, for example. But what they say and what they do seem not to be in dialogue with each other. Actually, recent policy debates have been dominated by an understanding of pluralism simply as related to the promotion of consumer choice, of making the menu a little longer, but never changing what is on the menu itself. Similarly, and this is of immense frustration to those of us who are trying to broaden the agenda. Actually, it's not even broaden it, it's just trying to say, this is your definition, come up with policy tools that will speak to your own definition. Similarly, to a certain extent, even more frustratingly with press freedom, where obviously, following phone hacking, uh, there has been a huge debate um, going on. Uh, and you now have a situation in which leading newspaper titles are claiming that they are the only people to be trusted with um, institutionalizing press freedom, despite the fact that it was their activities um, 
the phone hacking, the privileged access of proprietors to politicians, their refusal to tolerate any kind of independent audit um, of, of their activities. It was their activities that have so massively lowered the credibility of journalists, sadly, in the public's eye. But still, it's a notion that press freedom is, we heard it last night, is, is only something that should be available to those who have the money to buy a newspaper. So the term itself is, there, are, there is a war over the term itself. Um, and I think this is crucial because once you win the terms to your own advantage, then it makes it that much easier to develop the policies themselves. Secondly, I think this, uh, uh, the second feature of a fetishized policy environment is um, our obsession with evidence and metrics. But this is absolutely key to the contemporary policy environment. If you don't have the facts, if you can't marshal the arguments, if you don't turn up with the data, then your argument is worthless. Now, I am not, and please don't misquote me, arguing that we should dismiss the importance of evidence, or we should somehow argue that policy should somehow deride data, that we should be anti-data. That's certainly not what I'm arguing. But all I would point out is the way in which evidence is called for and incorporated um, uh, it, it speaks to me of the kind of phantom objectivity that I was just speaking about before, that guides a very human process. The mere appearance of data and evidence does not mean that it is an evidential or scientific process. Facts are important, but an evidence-led approach in itself is far from objective. Just think back to the FCC's pretty discredited diversity index, or indeed the whole the dispute about what reports and what facts you commission, or the ability to bury facts that are inconvenient. So um, that's the, the, the obsession with metrics as well. Um, third, that policy fetishism also means that instead of having a genuine debate in which we collectively set the terms uh, of debate and decide the agenda, the process, for me, is characterized by objectives that are already taken for granted, that it's a reified process. The, the, the whole, uh, um, the, the, the questions, the underlying questions have already been decided. So, for example, the intrinsic desirability of digital switchover or the intrinsic desirability of liberalization to produce efficiencies. Now, I'm not, again, Please don't misquote me, as if you would. I'm not arguing that digital switchover was a bad thing. I'm just saying, where was the public debate? Where were the, quote, stakeholders in saying what they wanted out of digital switch, um, switchover? Where are, the, uh, where are the more popular discussions of what we want out of a media policy environment? Um, I think, actually, that the, the benefits of all of these things are very rarely discussed with the people whose lives um, they're supposed to transform. Um, fourth, um, pretty obviously, in terms of fetishism, uh, involves the lack of public participation in the process as a whole. Now, actually, how do you take part in a process that seems so remote and so indifferent to you? Where are the access points? Where are the invitations to participate? I thought it was very interesting. Um, I mean, I wasn't there. Uh, there was a, um, a town hall meeting in Oakland last month, I think it was, where the FCC, I can't remember how many commissioners showed up, the chairman certainly did, and it sounded like, uh, it felt like it was a real, a vibrant occasion to actually have the opportunity for the public, that beast, the masses, however many there were, to engage in a rational debate with the chair of the FCC. Now, actually, once is a pretty lousy record, but that's one more than happens in the UK, where we never get the opportunity to have these kinds of genuine public debates over the setting of the policy process. It really is by invitation only. Opportunities for public participation pretty much consist of responding to government consultations on questions that have already been posed and on agendas already decided on. And who's going to bother? Who's going to bother? I always say this to my students, and you know, they have better, much more interesting things to do, let alone an ocean to swim in. Um, so public participation in the process, and facts, I, I think, is not just that it's hard to know how to get that entry point, but that it's seen by policymakers as annoying. Pu the, the public get in the way. They're a nuisance. Public observations are often ill-informed because the public doesn't have access to the, um, to the data. I always remember some great moment when I was doing interviews at the, uh, with, with a senior official in the FCC's media bureau just after the, um, when was it, it was mid-2010, 
2000s, 2005 or 6, and asking him, well, what did you do with those two million letters that were sent to you opposing the relaxation of the ownership rules? And he said, with his feet on the table, looking very comfortable, he said, well, we threw them away. I said, why did you do that? He said, they were all partisan. They weren't real. So that's two million voices were rejected in favour of a couple of studies of metrics. Um, the final aspect of fetishism is, is its ability to disguise the process itself, that we bestow power to an external force, and in doing so, we forget about our own investment in the situation. And I mean that, you know, that our own daily investment, eight hours of investment in this situation. Um, so that's how, you know, this is central to the ability of a narrow group of policymakers to be able to continue to do dominate the process, as otherwise we would be making different sets of demands. So fetishism helps to explain how we are prepared in a way, I don't know if this is the right term exactly, to outsource our, um, de uh, our de decisions about the shape of our media world to a process over which we have little control and little knowledge. Um, sometimes this does hit home. Sometimes there are explosive moments when we suddenly realise that we are being surveyed or we suddenly realise that we don't have a choice of cable providers or that our bills are going up. But these are important moments, but most of the time, media policy appears to be an activity that really takes place on a distant galaxy. So I guess I should move on to conclusions. Do I have a few more minutes? Some conclusions. Fetishism is not supposed to be a descriptive term. I mean, Marx used it in a way to, to evaluate the, the roots of the system um, that he was trying to make sense of. And I think one of the key things about using the term of fetishism is to understand that it, it, it helps to explain how we are disconnected from our true source of power and creativity in society, and that it helps us to think of ways of reconnecting ourselves to a capacity for change or to take control or to put our demands um, for the kind of media world that we want. So fetishism suggests mystery and transcendence, but is at the same time destructive, atomizing and disempowering. And in highlighting the process by which we cede control um, to, uh, uh, to these, uh, we cede control over the systems that we otherwise, I think, ought to, to be shaping, I hope that an understanding of fetishism can suggest to us a way forward to become, this is paraphrasing Marx, the master, not the servant, to turn vice into virtue, to turn passivity into activity. As Taussig puts it, the task before us is to liberate ourselves from the fetishism and phantom object, objectivity with which society obscures itself. Um, so I have two propositions. These are my, my two conclu conclusions of what we might want to do. The first one, which I think will, in a, in a faculty like this, is going to be a very popular and easy one. I probably shouldn't even make it. Maybe it's more of a methodological one. And that is that we shouldn't insulate questions of policy from those of content and creative practice and from the spaces of media institutions and flows. And I think all too often, maybe not here, but certainly uh, in Britain and in Europe, there is that separation between those two spheres. And that this is this artificial separation for me that we often see between media policy on the one hand and media production and consumption on the other, I think it weakens all of us because the aesthetic strategies, the creative endeavours, the forms of resistance that may or may not be pop, uh, present in popular everyday communication um, are critically related to the wider structural contexts of media environments in which certain types of behaviour and certain political preferences um, are rewarded or marginalised. So the ability, for example, to speak truth to power, but also to represent the voices of ordinary people, to speak in dialects, in popular dialects, to speak in the terms that ordinary people speak in, um, to open up conversations that maybe other people don't want to open up, to reflect the way a society is headed. All of this, all of this is dependent on policy choices debated or not debated, uh, but the policy choices that are enacted in any contemporary mediated society. So I think, and again, this is a source of frustration for many of us who have this more expensive view of policy, um, that we have to put policy and content together. Partly, pragmatically speaking, it makes policy so much sexier if you can do it. So that's one tip. The second way of reconnecting media policy to the publics on whose basis it is supposed to be enacted, I think, is around the project of media reform, which is obviously a contested term in itself. But I see as um, I'm inspired by the reform movements that, that, that um, are popping up 
across the world in which ordinary individuals attempt, attempt to take some control and then in so doing that necessarily impacts on the policy process. These may not be formal policy interventions. They're not couched in the polite legislative langa, uh, uh, language. They're actually couched usually in anger. So, for example, I mean, you know, I suppose that whenever it was, a couple of weeks back, there were more than one million signatures aimed at calling on the FCC to reintroduce net neutrality rules. I hope that is accompanied by a, a vibrant movement as well. This is what happened um, a couple of years ago in Mexico City, where you had the Yosoy like, 132. I, I'm not going to embarrass myself, whatever it is in Spanish, but the Yosoy 132 student movement during the election took to the streets, galvanized by what they saw as the incredibly anti-democratic duopoly of Televisa and TV Azteca. This was a popular movement that puts media policy onto the streets in a way which I think makes it that much. You know, it, again, this is where it's dirty and sexy, but it is about people trying to take back control of the process, no matter the language that they use. You also have um, that's Athens last year, where the, the, uh, under the guise of austerity, the Greek government just shut down unilaterally the Greek public service broadcasting system to huge outrage, mass protests, which has galvanized the whole debate around what public service broadcasting or the need for a democratic broadcaster in, in Greece. One of my favorite ones, this is from um, Istanbul last, last June, um, where protesters gathered outside. You remember there they were the... Um, the, the riots in, in uh, Gezi Park, that in the middle of Istanbul where they, the government tried to uh, shut down, build a shopping mall effectively and take away some public space. And the private media uh, refused to cover the huge demonstrations. And in fact, oh, I can't remember the animal. They showed a, was it about puffins or penguins? They showed a fascinating documentary about some arctic animal and refused to show the huge demonstrations that were going on. That actually says that... Um, um, uh, placard there says, we'll pay, parazi nezi verelim, we'll pay whatever it takes. It's turning the language of the private broadcasters back onto them. We'll pay for our protests to be covered by you. I think in a way that is again putting media policy, questions of ownership control, back into the public domain. Um, closer to home, I'm sure you all know um, what, what happened last, uh, when was it, last May in the US against the takeover of local newspapers by um, the, the Koch brothers. The idea, basically, is that we need to see ourselves as activists to reconnect, reconnect ourselves to these movements. So what we need in these circumstances today is an approach to media policy that is critical as opposed to administrative. Political as opposed to simply being partisan. Interested as opposed to pretending to be disinterested. For me, committed to delivering social justice and equality instead of serving the interests of either state elites or private elites. When we're thinking about questions of ownership, obscenity, net neutrality, or press freedom, I think we need to see and, and conceive of policy as, yes, an empirical fact, but also as an ideological tool and, crucially, as a means of reform. And in that way, I hope, we can try and transform media policy from being a fetish to be an instrument designed to deliver real pleasure. A media system run for our benefit, not for the pockets of moguls, the egos of politicians, or the imperatives of governments. It may be a terrible movie, but when you're faced with a spectral object, my argument is that we all need, more than ever, to be Ghostbusters. Thank you very much.